Today's video is brought to you by Skillshare. Hello everyone and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Welcome to 2024. Today we have not one, not two, <laughs> not three, but four huge stacks of books to go through because to start the year I thought I would collect a bunch of books that I want to read in the coming year because this year we're living 2024 the plot not just in terms of being dumb and silly and chaotic but also book plots that's why I'm interested in baby so I thought that this video could be a fun way to inspire you with some books that I think are really interesting that I'm gonna try and read in 2024 and some of them may interest you as well just a disclaimer as always when I do these videos this is a lot of books and I want to remind you that this is my full-time job I work as a full-time book critic my job is just book <laughs> this is all I do it's all I think about and I feel so so enormously lucky to get to do this, but when I share the fact that I've bought this amount of books, please remember that's because I make content about books for a living. And that's why it makes sense for me to buy physical books, so I have a visual aid for you guys to watch on YouTube, on TikTok, on Instagram. It makes my content more interesting to have a physical book, and I collect them so that I can refer back to them in these videos. So I'm not suggesting for any second that this is a normal amount of books to buy, but I like to do one big book haul at the beginning of the year and one big book haul halfway through the year just to give you guys a taster of what books I am interested in. So I just want to put this in context, I guess. This is about like three months of reading for me because I'm very, very fortunate to get to dedicate my life to it, to talking about books and sharing the best of literature with you guys. So take this more as a showcase of what's available, of inspiration of what you could potentially want to read and let's go through them shall we so let's talk about this book first and foremost so I have a little collection of these mini penguin black classics just up here and this is the newest addition to this collection these are literally three pounds each this is white knights by Dostoevsky why did I buy this because I was influenced I literally saw one tweet that said very simply you think you understand love and then you read white knights by Dostoevsky and I said sold Take my card, cash or credit. I need that in my life. Like that one little description was enough. They should put that on the cover of this. I mean, <laughs> it sold pretty well on its own without that, but I also seem to have dressed <laughs> like this book today. I seem to be cosplaying as this book. Like <laughs> you are what you eat, you are what you read. I really love Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky, but that's the only of his books that I've read. It's described as a devastating story of solitude and unrequited love, so say no more. That is White Knights. I also have another Dostoevsky book, which is considerably chunkier. This is Devils, translated by Constance Garnett. In 1869, a young Russian was strangled, shot through the head, and thrown into a pond. His crime? A wish to leave a small group of revolutionaries from which he had become alienated. Dostoevsky takes this real-life catastrophe as the subject and culmination of Devils, a title that refers to the young radicals themselves and also to the materialistic ideas that possessed the minds of many thinking people in Russian society at the time. And I'm very intrigued to read more of Dostoevsky's work. Another author I have multiple books from is the Queen herself, Mary Oliver. She is the I-T-G-I-R-L. She is that girl. And she writes these gorgeous poems that are all very rooted in the natural world and nature being the best teacher we can have in this life. She speaks about this kind of childlike innocence and yeah, the lessons that the world around us can teach us without the interference of technology and media. I say, as a YouTuber. <laughs> but for me, I really like this um, as a bit of a break from reading very contemporary fiction that is based on technology and social media and dystopias. Her books really venerate the things around us that occur naturally and yeah, it just feels really lovely to read. So this is A Thousand Mornings, this is one of her poetry collections. Whether studying the leaves of a tree or mourning her treasured dog Percy, Oliver is beautifully open to the teachings contained within the smallest of moments. And I really like that. One thing I really gravitate towards in the books that I buy is books that think about the microscopic, granular details of our day, of our lives, and celebrating them and thinking about what we can learn from the very small, daily, ordinary occurrences that we encounter, as well as the big scary things, you know, the big existential things. I like that we just slow down a little bit and take things as they come and appreciate every single moment, not just 
the big life-changing ones. So anyway, in A Thousand Mornings, she explores with startling clarity, humour and kindness the mysteries of our daily experiences. And then on a similar note, this is her other poetry collection, Dog Songs, and these are all about dogs. <laughs> and if you are a dog owner, if you love dogs, I feel like this is essential reading. I've read a couple of the poems already and they're just so lovely. Just about that inexplicable bond that we have with our pets, with the dogs in our lives, and it really captures the essence of that love that we have for our little fluffy companions, you know? I'm definitely gonna give this to my mum after I'm done, I think she'll really enjoy this. This could be a great gift actually, dog songs, for the dog lover in your life. I can already imagine myself gifting this to many, many people. So yeah, two books from Mary Oliver as well. Sticking with the theme of poetry, because I've actually got quite a lot of poetry, I'm really gonna be focusing a lot on writing my novel this year. And when I'm in deep writing mode, I try to read more poetry than novels, just because I wanna make sure that I'm not replicating someone else's writing style or being too inspired by someone else's work. You know, if I'm really loving a book, I wanna make sure that I'm still being a totally unique writer and that I'm capturing my own tone consistently. So sometimes I think when you're caught up in someone else's world and worldview and their writing style, you gotta be really careful not to <laughs> accidentally replicate it, so, or like echo it. So I prefer to read a lot of poetry. I also think that when I'm reading a lot of poetry, it gives me license to write in a more embellished way. And then I can always edit later if it's a bit too much, but when I'm in the world of poetry, it kind of makes me feel like I have permission to use lots of metaphors and similes and think outside the box about the world around me. So anyways, I also picked up this book. This is Fragments of Sappho called If Not Winter and it's translated by Anne Carson. In 2023, one of my favorite books that I read and actually one of the last books of the year that I read was called After Sappho and that is a collection of kind of vignettes almost about different women working in creative industries who came after the poet Sappho. So people like Virginia Woolf, for example, but in that collection, there were so many references, of course, to the poet Sappho. She was kind of like the anchor of the novel that it kept kind of, she was like the center of gravity, I guess, that we kept returning to and what made the collection cohesive. And as a result, there were lots of fragments of her poetry. And so immediately, I went to the bookshop and was like, I need more of that. <laughs> I need a whole collection of Sappho's poetry. And so that's what this is and curated by Anne Carson. So who's also a very talented poet in her own right. So really, really fascinated by this. And I think it's going to be a source of much inspiration for me. Now, speaking of writing my book, my book is historical fiction, which I'm actually going to be talking a bit more about in my writing newsletter, which will be linked down below in the description box of this video. I'll be explaining why I chose to write a historical fiction novel, but the goat of historical fiction was, of course, Hilary Mantel. Wolf Hall is held in such high regard as kind of like the pinnacle of historical fiction. Like, this is as good as it gets, pretty much. Twice winner of the Man Booker Prize, in Wolf Hall, one of our very best writers brings the opulent, brutal world of the Tudors to bloody, glittering life. It is the backdrop to the rise and rise of Thomas Cromwell. Lowborn boy, charmer, bully, master of deadly intrigue, and finally, most powerful of Henry VIII's courtiers. So this is a beast of a book, but one I'm very intrigued to read, just in terms of studying the craft of writing a historical fiction novel and how to do it really, really, really well. Hilary Mantel is the undisputed queen of this genre, and I wanted to understand how the master works. And these were actually available as a set, so I also bought the sequel, which is called Bring Up the Bodies. And it is a trilogy, but the final book in the series at the moment, the paperback edition, is bigger than these two. Like, they don't all fit together. That's why I said, I'll wait. <laughs> I'll wait until the publishing industry gets its shit together and publishes a version of this book that is the same height as these two books so that they look nice on my bookshelf. Yes, I am petty, but also I've got some time because this is going to take me a minute to get through. I do have two whole books to get to before I need that third one in the trilogy, so hopefully by that point, because it's a relatively recent release, hopefully by that point I will be able to track down an edition of this book that is the same height as these two. Anyways, that's just on a totally superficial level, that's why I don't have the third one yet. <laughs> but I will be reading it for sure. Now, speaking of 2024 and a year of basically possibilities, and also a year of focusing on ourselves and self-improvement and investing in ourselves and the things that we want to achieve, I am buzzing to let you know that today's video is very, very kindly brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is the largest online learning community full of creative people learning 
learning and sharing their knowledge. There are thousands of classes led by industry professionals who know what they're talking about so you can pick up all of their skills. Whether that's in film, design, illustration, photography, anything you can imagine, there's an amazing level of breadth but also depth. It's very much a learn by doing style of teaching. On this platform of on-demand lessons, you can do them anytime, anywhere. And if you're kind of wondering, where do I begin my learning journey? How do I start making steps towards achieving my goals? Skillshare has you covered because they have these really amazing learning parts. And I've been taking and will continue to be taking as many of the writing, creative writing classes as I can. So to give you a little taster of the creative writing learning parts, you could take creative essay writing, explore the personal and powerful, write powerful short fiction, or the class I'm currently taking, which is develop memorable fictional characters. I love that you can just dip into these classes as and when you're ready, take it completely at your own pace, revisit moments that you want to go back on, and it's definitely a form of self-care to take some time to learn something that you've always wanted to know more about. So the best news is that the first 500 people to click the link in my description box will get a free month of Skillshare. Let me know what course you're going to take in 2024. There are literally tons, so it's definitely worth taking some time to scroll through and seeing which ones take your fancy, but I highly, highly, highly recommend checking out Skillshare and the link is down below. This next book is one I received for Christmas. It's called Now Go on Grief and Studio Ghibli. It's by Carl Thomas Smith and earlier this year, I mean last year, in 2023, no it's gonna take some getting used to because when I say two years ago I very much mean 2018 and that is very much six years ago now, let alone referring to 2023 as last year. Anyway, all this to say in 2023 I went to Japan and when I was getting ready to go to Japan I watched so many Studio Ghibli movies and when I was in Japan, Studio Ghibli is absolutely everywhere. It's one of their greatest exports, I think, and just so heartwarming and wonderful. The animation is gorgeous. It's my favorite animation style by far. And this is a book all about how grief is portrayed in Studio Ghibli movies, which I thought was fascinating. Grief is real. It's physical. It doesn't just happen or even happen to you. It is there next to you always. Grief is all around us, even at the heart of the brightly coloured, vividly characterised, joyful films of Studio Ghibli. They are racked with loss and now Go explores that. So since I consume so many of these movies, I thought it would be interesting to take a more critical look at them and think of them as a collection as well as individual movies and how the studio presents grief, especially because it is primarily, I suppose, for children. How does it introduce young people to the concept of grief? Because that's, of course, such a difficult, heavy topic to try to unpack in a movie designed for children. Although, of course, the Studio Ghibli films are very evergreen. I think you could watch them at any age and still find them as poignant and moving and touching. So, yeah, I thought it would be interesting to think about them through a critical lens through this essay collection. I'm especially intrigued by, like, Totoro, and I think this is going to make me want to revisit watching all of the Studio Ghibli movies as well. Okay, so... This next book is What You Are Looking For is in the Library. I mean, hello? This was also a gift. I mean, I've very much branded my channel as like YouTube's resident librarian. And so anything with a library on it is like, Perfect. Actually, this is such a great gift that I got from my friend Kat. Just as a tangent, this is an embosser. So basically I can emboss all of my books on the inside page and it will say, from the library of Jack Edwards. How cool is that? Such a thoughtful gift. Thank you, Catherine. Such a brilliant present idea for anyone who loves books in your life and collects books. Now they can emboss their books so that when they give them out to their friends, the first page is embossed with the book owner's name. I think I should make a video where I go through my collection of books and emboss them all. I think that'd be really sweet. But anyway, I I digress. All this to say, this book is called What You Are Looking For is in the Library. This is by Michiko Aoyama and translated by Alison Watts. Originally published in Japanese and was the winner of the Japanese Booksellers Award. So if booksellers voted for this as being a great book about book selling, that's got to stand for something, right? And basically, one thing you can absolutely guarantee is if there's a Japanese book with a cat on the cover, it's going in my collection. I really love the Japanese style of storytelling and so I'm always keen to read more works by Japanese authors and also learn more about Japanese culture. So yeah, that is what you are looking for is in the library, which is pretty much my life motto. If I can't find it in the library, I don't want it. Sticking with a similar theme, this is The Diary of a Bookseller. This is by Sean Beidel. It's described as warm, witty and laugh out loud funny. Again, this feels like a book lover's dream. This is exactly what I want to be reading about. And maybe by reading about a bookshop, 
it will satiate my desire to like go to a bookshop. Instead, I can just read about one. <laughs> so, and also how gorgeous is that cover? It's actually merging very well <laughs> with my background. Now back to non-fiction. This is interesting stories about curious words from Stealing Thunder to Red Herrings. Now Susie Dent works on the show Countdown in Dictionary Corner and she is a lexicographer and dictionary expert. So she talks a lot about word etymology, which basically just means the origin of words, where they come from, how they've been used over time, how their meanings have changed and warped and shifted. And she is a fountain of knowledge. She is my dream dinner party guest, I'm telling you. I saw her at Hay Festival last year and freaked out. Like I was genuinely starstruck. She is my Oprah. I think Susie Dent is like the coolest person ever. And I'm really interested by etymology. So this I think is going to be fascinating to think about the origins of curious little phrases and idioms that we have in the English language. And it is also signed by the author. So cool. And I love thinking about the origins of words. So I'm looking forward to flicking through this. I feel like this is one that I'll like pick up every now and then because otherwise it's a lot of information to try and <laughs> take in in one sitting. A book I know I'm going to absolutely fly through, however, is this one. This is In the Margins by Elena Ferrante on the pleasures of reading and writing. I love books about writing by writers because they write with such fondness about the thing that they have dedicated their life to. And I think that the title comes from the fact that Elena Fronte talks about how she was always struggling to keep her writing within the margins as a kid. You know, she always wanted to like add things and scroll outside of the assigned space. And I suppose that may be her approach to writing in general, writing outside of what is expected of you. She is the author of incredibly successful books like My Brilliant Friend, The Lost Daughter, etc, etc. And so I would love to get a little insight into her mind, especially because she's actually completely anonymous. No one knows, or at least no one is supposed to know, who Elena Ferrante is, that she'd been crazy people who have tried to go to extreme measures to work out who she is, um, but she chose to be private and I really respect that. So it's great to get this insight into her mind because she doesn't do interviews or anything really. It's a subtle yet candid book by one of the great novelists of our time about her adventures in literature, both in and out of the margins. So as someone who is writing their debut novel, I think for me it's really fascinating to think about the craft of writing from the experts, from those who know a thing or 12 <laughs> about what it is to write a, an incredible and successful book that really resonates with a lot of people. So I, if I can just consume and absorb like 1% of her knowledge, my book will be better. Speaking of masters of the craft, Clarice Lispector, I think she is one of the best writers ever. And I read my first of her books last year and was instantly enthralled. And so a goal for this year is to read way more Clarice Lispector. So this is Agua Viva. In this book, Clarice Lispector aims to capture the present, her direct, confessional, and unfiltered meditations on everything from life and time to perfume and sleep are strange and hypnotic in their emotional power and have been a huge influence on many artists and writers. So she's a Brazilian writer, very much praised as being one of the great writers of a generation and very much praised as being one of the great emblematic writers of her generation. This is translated by Stefan Tobler and I cannot wait to dive into it. I love books, like I said, that just observe the world that we live in and seek to pick it apart at the seams a little bit. The other books that I've read from her have been so astute in their observations and I just love the way that she experiences the world and so can't wait for this, Agua Viva. Another author I am returning to is David Diop. I loved his book, At Night All Blood Is Black, and this is Beyond the Door of No Return. Translated from French by Sam Taylor, this is described as stunningly realized and written in exquisite prose. It's a love story, an adventure tale, and an unflinching examination of the unexpected ways that colonialism and greed ravaged everyone it touched, European, and African. It's tragic and tender, alive with feeling. This is a story of adventure, revenge, and impossible desires, which subverts our every expectation about who we are and who we love. Say no more, David. Say no more. Returning to a novelist whose writing you absolutely adore 
is very exciting because you kind of know, okay, I already can rely on the writing style, the lyrical way that he writes being very up my street, so now I just hope this has a great plot as well. And if it does, it has all the ingredients to become a new favourite, so we will see. Beyond the door of no return. That is a door I will happily go through. Oh, speaking of which, I think this might be my most highly anticipated book of the whole year. I'm gonna say it, that's a big claim, but... It's the book I'm most excited to read. My mom got me this for Christmas, thank you mom. And it is a retelling of George Orwell's 1984, the most famous dystopian book of all time, one of the most influential books ever that I think changed the culture. <laughs> anyway, this is a retelling of that book from Julia's perspective. 1984 mostly focuses on its main character, Winston, and Julia is a kind of side character slash love interest, but she goes to all these like crazy black markets. She goes on all these little side quests. She goes on all these little side quests and Winston is kind of unfazed by them, but I remember thinking at the time, I would love to know more about that and how she handled those situations, how she keeps getting away with these things in this kind of totalitarian society. And so this book is going to unpack that. So it's 1984 and Julia Worthing works as a mechanic fixing the novel writing machines in the fiction departments at the Ministry of Truth in London. Under the rule of the party and its leader, Big Brother, Julia routinely breaks the law, but also collaborates with the regime whenever necessary. Everyone likes Julia, a diligent member of the junior anti sex league, though she is secretly promiscuous, she knows how to survive in a world of constant surveillance. Amidst newspeak, doublethink, and the threat of the thought police, she is adept at staying alive. I cannot wait for this! For the millions of readers who have been brought up with Orwell's 1984, that's me, <laughs> this play is about us, here is a provocative, mischievous, and utterly gripping companion novel. I always love when books are in conversation with another book. Swimming in the Dark being in conversation with Giovanni's Room, My Dark Vanessa being in constant conversation with Lolita, and now Julia being in constant dialogue with 1984. Sign me up. Say no more. I'm into it. I'm so into it. And I'm almost like saving this book for the right moment where I can really just become obsessed with it. I really hope that I have such high expectations of this book. If it lets me down, I genuinely don't know if I'll ever recover. <laughs> <laughs> but that is Julia by Sandra Newman, and you know, in the time of Greek mythological retellings where we're recentering female narratives, I think it's about time that some of our modern classics get a second look at too. So this is Julia. Next, we have YN by Esther Yi. Sumptuous, precise, and full of pulsing, startling life. Yi captures with finesse the rhythms of internet voyeurism. She also speaks about parasocial desire and the very heartbeat of contemporary longing. So I feel like this is a book about yearning. It's about feeling like your life has only just begun when a certain person arrives into it, and also an insight into fan or stan culture. I guess it gets its title from the kind of fan fiction thing of YN meaning your name, so you can insert yourself into a narrative, and maybe we're all meant to insert ourselves into this narrative and think about our relation to the people we are fans of in any capacity. So yeah, this is YN and I am very much looking forward to this as someone who is chronically online. Guilty. This book is called Profit. Firstly, that cover design is gorgeous. When I saw this in the bookshop, I was like, I need to touch it. <laughs> your happiest memory is there deadliest weapon. And also Neil Gaiman describes it as a fabulous a page turner. And if it's good enough for Neil, it's good enough for me. This is profit. It knows when you were happiest. It knows when you're, oh wait, <laughs> no. It gives life to your fondest memories and uses them to destroy you. Sounds like some people I know. <laughs> But who has created it and what do they want? Profit can weaponize the past, but only love will protect the future. So I think this is kind of where fantasy meets thriller. And I'm interested in the way it's going to sort of bend genres and experiment with the concept of invention and how modern day science fiction is conceptualizing the future of technology. So that is profit. Oh, this was given to me by someone who went to Puerto Rico who knows I love reading books from different parts of the world. This is the way to my heart. This is Louis Negron's Mundo Cruel, and it's translated by Suzanne Jill Levine. And it's a short story collection about the queer community and attitudes towards the queer community in Puerto Rico. And I'm really on a mission to read books from as many parts of the world as possible, and this was a real blind spot in my knowledge, so 
Not anymore. These nine stories are rude, beautiful, funny, tender, sarcastic, but above all, human. Sounds great to me. This next book is On Women by Susan Sontag. Now, Notes on Camp is like one of the greatest pieces of literary criticism of all time. So much so it was a Met Gala theme. And I remember reading that and thinking that I loved the way that Susan Sontag explained things and wrote about theory because it's so elevated and intense, I suppose, intellectually. And yet Susan Sontag makes it accessible because of the clarity of which she writes. Because, you know, it's that thing of like, when you're reading really complicated theory, you want to be able to understand it. And I think that the way Susan Sontag writes is not pretentious, it's very to the point and powerful and effective, but in a way that is understandable too. So anyway, this is her collection of essays on women of the female experience. Sontag was one of the most formidable, original and influential thinkers of the last century. And indeed, her writing rejects the familiar and refuses party lines. On Women presents seven essays and exchanges spanning a range of subjects. The challenges and humiliations were women face as they age, the relationship between women's liberation and class struggle, beauty which Sontag calls the over-rich brew of many familiar opposites, feminine fascism, etc, etc. So I think this is going to cover a lot of bases and also help me to make my feminism more intersectional. So yeah, this is Susan Sontag's On Women. Oh, this title I think is absolute perfection. Like, find me a better book title, I will wait. This is A Nearby Country called Love. Just take a minute, <laughs> a moment of silence to appreciate that title, thank you. This is by Salah Abdo. It's described as harrowing, beautiful, surprising. If you start your novel description with harrowing, I will be reading it, thank you. Vibrant and evocative, intimate and intelligent, a nearby country called Love is both a captivating window into contemporary Iran and a portrait of the parallel fates of a man and his country. A man who acknowledges the sullen and rumbling baggage of history, but then chooses to step past his violent inheritance. I just thought that sounded so wonderful and so... I will be reading it in 2024. This is definitely gonna be one of my first reads of the year. The next book is this one. This is called No Man's Land, Living Between Two Cultures. And this is another one of the Inkling editions, the same as the Studio Ghibli book. This is about what they call identity limbo. It's about existing between two cultures, specifically people who have been born in one country and have grown up in that country, have always lived in that country and been a part of that culture, but their family heritage links back to someplace else. And it's a really interesting idea that I see discussed a lot in literature, and so I wanted to kind of deep dive into that. Books like If I Survive You, books where basically the central protagonist feels somewhere between two cultural identities and is never enough for each one to fully assimilate. And I read a lot about the diaspora, it's a theme that is commonly explored in contemporary literary fiction, and so I thought that a kind of critical lens looking at this idea um, and putting some theory behind it would be really, really fascinating to, I guess, educate myself a little bit more on this sentiment, this feeling. So that is No Man's Land, Living Between Two Cultures. The question isn't really who is British and can call themselves so, the question is if you're British enough. So I think this is specifically um, about this person's experience within the UK. Exploring how it is to feel one thing and yet be perceived as another, the emotions felt within the limbo and why culture truly matters. More so, she considers how this is manifested through history and specifically the British Empire. So I think that's going to be fascinating. Now this next book was actually rated one of the Amazon books, best books of 2023, and I've seen it absolutely everywhere. It is called The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store. I feel like this is one of those books which is very critically acclaimed, but also universally loved by people who have read it, which is a really fine balance because often books that receive literary prizes aren't always the most readable or bingeable or enjoyed by like the mass market. Often books that capture widespread appeal aren't necessarily like the most critically acclaimed books. So to find a book like this that toes the line and hits both, kind of like Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, The Song of Achilles, like books that are page turners, but also critics love them. So anyway, this is the Heaven and Earth Grocery Store by James McBride, and the description is this. A novel about small town secrets and the people who keep them. It's set in 1972 in Pennsylvania. When digging the foundations of a new housing development, the last thing the workers expected to uncover was a human skeleton. Who the skeleton was and how it got buried there were just two of the long-held secrets that had been kept for decades by the residents of Chicken Hill, the dilapidated neighborhood where immigrant Jews and African-Americans lived side by side. 
sharing ambitions and sorrows. As the novel unfolds, it becomes clear how much the people of Chicken Hill have to struggle to survive at the margins of white Christian America, and how damaging bigotry, hypocrisy, and deceit can be to a community. Bringing his masterful storytelling skills and his deep faith in humanity to the Heaven and Earth grocery store, James McBride has written a novel full of compassion. Okay, interesting. It's kind of giving me Sula by Toni Morrison energy, and that's my favorite book ever. So I need this in my life, I can't wait to read it, and I'll let you know very soon what I think. Okay, I've got a bunch of poetry here. This is the forward book of Poetry 2024, so this is a poetry anthology, and I like reading poetry anthologies because I think that they're a great way of discovering voices that I may not have come across otherwise. So in a collection that features all of these different writers and poets, and authors, you're not gonna love every single one because of course each one will have a different writing style, but it's a great little introduction to lots of different people and if you don't like the poem, that's okay. On the next page will be a poem by someone else. And if you do like the poem, then it gives you a bit of guidance as to what to read next and when you go to the bookstore, whose poetry you should be looking for and picking up. So I always recommend if you're trying to get into poetry, pick up a poetry anthology. So this is the forward book of poetry 2024. And I'm excited this is gonna be super contemporary and modern and platforming people who are writing great poetry right now. I also picked up this poetry collection, it's called Heritage Aesthetics, an eviscerating lyric tour de force on the personal ramifications of colonial structures and divisive histories. As you can tell from my reading, like world literature and post-colonial literature is something that particularly interests me, so that's why I wanted to read some more poetry, that kind of thing. So we kind of go from very contemporary modern poetry to a titan of the industry. This is Selected Poems of Neruda, it's a beast. This collection contains Neruda's resonant, exploratory, and intensely individualistic verse. That was a tongue twister, Jesus! This far into the video, this far into recording, you can't hit me with intensely individualistic. <laughs> That's like gymnastics for my mouth. Rooted in the physical landscape and the people of Chile. I basically, <laughs> I just follow a bunch of accounts on Instagram and Twitter and threads who post poetry every single day. And whenever I see this particular poet, I find myself liking, retweeting, resharing, whatever. And so I was like, let's take this, let's take this one step further. Let's progress our relationship a little bit and I'll buy your book and I will read it. And I really can't wait to dive into this. Next, we have Terra Story. This is also a signed copy. I picked this up in Greenlight's bookstore in Brooklyn, which is one of my favorite bookshops ever. It's in Fort Greene, it's actually right near the Center for Fiction, so you can kind of go to both if you're in the area. There we go, this one's signed, and both of them often have lots of really cool signed editions, because it's the kind of place that authors love. Um, so if you're looking for signed editions, I would recommend that. From the author of the acclaimed novel Temporary, an intimate exploration of time, a fable about love, an epic daydream for a broken-hearted world. Hilary Leiter's profound second novel asks how we nurture love when death looms over every moment. From one of our most innovative and daring writers, Terror Story is an outstanding meditation on loss, a reverie about extinction, and a map for where to go next. I think this is about a family who find a hidden terrace in one of their closets in their house, so they open the door and unlock this whole new part of the house, and I think that allows them to contemplate a few things that maybe they have been avoiding or refusing to acknowledge beforehand. So I thought this sounded like something I absolutely have to read. So that is Terror Story. Now, my good friend Ben Mercer makes these wonderful TikToks where he reads aloud from the books that he loves. And one of his favorite books of last year was Kick the Latch. He said this was such a unique book, impossible to put down, and I said, well, let me pick it up then. <laughs> let me give that a go. You know when you just really trust someone's opinion? I really trust Ben. Um, so this is ruthlessly concise and artful. This is described as lightning in a bottle with its ruthless concision and artful mysteries. Based on a transcribed interview with Sonia, a horse trainer, this novel vividly captures the arc of one woman's life at the racetrack, whittled down with a fiercely singular artistry. Kick the Latch bangs out of the starting gate and carries the reader on a careening joyride around the inside track. I have to say, I don't think I've ever read a book about racehorses, so this is gonna be new for me as well. It comes at you fast and it's a hell of a ride. I loved it. I feel like this is a book I'm gonna save when I get myself into a reading slump and need something to like drag me out kicking and screaming. 
kicking the latch. This book, I just absolutely love the title of, Water Shall Refuse Them. It's by Lucy McKnight Hardy, it's described as an impressive debut which conveys an atmosphere of imminent menace. It's set in a small town on the border of Wales, and I'm pretty sure it's about a woman who is kind of like practicing witchcraft who meets a teen boy who is very interested in what she's up to, and I think that dynamic is super, super interesting. That kind of juxtaposition of those two people who normally we haven't seen come into contact in literature. A coming of age story where the threat of violence shimmers like a heat wave. This next book was shortlisted for the International Booker Prize and I really, really trust the opinion of the Booker Prize, both for fiction and translated fiction. It also won the English Pen Award, so this is Boulder by Eva Balthazar. Translated by Julia Sanchez, a lot of people I follow and love on these platforms have really, really sung the praises of this book. Again, it's a quick, short read. A cook on a merchant ship comes to know and love Samsa, a woman who gives her the nickname Boulder. When Samsa gets a job in Reykjavik and the couple decides to move in together, Samsa declares that she wants to have a child now that they are settled. Boulder is less enthused but doesn't know how to say no. Wow, that's crazy. And so finds herself dragged along on a journey that feels as thankless to her as it is alien. It's described as exquisite, dark, and unconventional. Eve Balthazar turns intimacy into a wild pleasure. I think this is going to explore how a relationship dynamic changes and shifts and warps once the context of which you met changes, because obviously they meet on a boat, and now they're on dry land, will they still be compatible? Are they still as into one another, or was their relationship in that original setting one of convenience and proximity? Wow, that is Boulder by Eve Balthazar. And my memory card is filling up, give me one second, I gotta delete some stuff. There we go, one thing about me is I will be yapping. I will be filling up a memory card with yapping. <laughs> so anyway, the next book is called Close to Home. It's by Michael McGee. As you can see, I got this half price. We love a bargain. I got this in the Boxing Day sales. This is Luminous and Devastating. Close to Home is a novel about deciding what kind of man you want to be and finding your place in the scarred city you call home. I'm always really into books that talk about the feeling of returning to a place that you once used to know really intimately. It's so disorientating because on one hand it feels familiar and on another hand it feels totally foreign, like you have been wiped from the place and yet you know it so well. This novel is described as beautifully observant and sharp as a knife tip. So now you can see why I picked this up and I got a little bargain on it too. And then book lover math is because I was buying one book that was half price, I was like well I might as well buy another book that's also half price and then it's just like buying one book we're getting two. So this is Carla by Colin Walsh. What a story, I was riveted, this is a dazzling novel. Against the backdrop of a town suffocating on its own secrets, in a story that builds from a smolder to a stunning climax, I really like books that, you know, over the course of the novel we're building up, building up, building up, and then there's this huge kind of crescendo. At the end I feel like it's such an emotional cathartic experience, like it really feels like a purge of the emotions. Spending a whole novel getting to know this cast of characters and then right at the end something insane happens, like um, in Elena Knows or There There, so many books that I really really love have this kind of narrative arc. So anyways, Carla brilliantly examines the sometimes brutal costs of belonging, as well as the battle in the human heart between vengeance and forgiveness, despair and redemption. It's set in a seaside town in Ireland, again focusing on people who were friends as children, six inseparable teenagers, reconnect 15 years later. And the ringleader of that group, Carla, has gone missing. This feels like it's going to be addictive, and one maybe for the true crime lovers amongst us. This is The Archive of Feelings. It's by Peter Stamm and translated by Michael Hoffman, and it's about getting a second chance with an old love. A coolly detached and archivist questions the life he could have had and whether it's not too late to live it. Stamps prose, beautifully translated by Michael Hoffman, is plain but not so simple, a subtle but deadly style. So there's a bit of a theme in these last few books about people crossing paths again after a lot of time has passed once contexts have changed. So clearly when I was book shopping that was something I was very interested in. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, this one is called New Millennium Boys. This is by Alex Kazemi, who Brett Easton Ellis describes as his favourite millennial provocateur. And I love the description on the back that says there is no way a robot could have written this book. Like this is not a book that ChatGPT would be able to have written and that 
fascinates me. <laughs> that has me hooked. With this dreamlike dialogue tale of bored privileged boys, it collides pop culture with the accessibility of internet notoriety. The ultimate blend for our epidemic of sickness unto death spinning through cyberspace. So I feel like this is going to be super relevant, super current, very contemporary about growing up kind of on the internet, which is something I kind of have done. So that is New Millennium Boys. This next book is called Bird by Bird, and this is kind of a bit of a bible when it comes to the art of writing fiction. I've read so many things about like the books you absolutely need to read if you want to be a writer, and pretty much every list includes Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird. Instructions on writing and life, a warm, generous, and hilarious guide through the writer's world and its treacherous swamps. Even the description was kind of lyrical and poetic, so <laughs> I think that this will be kind of essential reading for me as someone who hopes to enter the kind of literary landscape and something that I think will be good for me to read while I am writing because it's not going to distract me, but it will hopefully just inspire me to be better and do better and hopefully I'll pick up some tips and tricks along the way which I'll of course share with you guys too. This is called Hangman, it's a novel by Maya Binyam. In the morning I received a phone call and was told to board a flight. The arrangements had been made on my behalf, I packed no clothes because my clothes had been packed for me. A car arrived to pick me up. How could you possibly read that and not want to know what happens next? That situation is Bonkers. A man returns home to sub-Saharan Africa after 26 years in America. When he arrives, he finds that he doesn't recognize the country or anyone in it. Thankfully, someone recognizes him, a man who calls him brother, setting him on a quest to find his real brother who is dying. Like this concept is chef's kiss. Yes, this is why I bought this book. More poetry, this is Survival Takes a Wild Imagination. This is by Fariha Roizen. This poet writes, prays, claws, and scratches her way out of the grips of generational trauma. I was like, I have to read that instantly. And I actually started reading it. I read like the first couple poems on the train home after I bought this book, and I have to say, I think this is gonna be a very high rating for me. I really, really liked this book and I'm looking forward to finishing it. Now, I, as I've said, as I might have mentioned, I'm obsessed with dictionaries. I'm obsessed with lexicography, word etymology, and this is the dictionary people. My grandmother got me this for Christmas. This is about the unsung heroes who created the Oxford English Dictionary. And my favorite fact about the OED is that Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, he worked for the Oxford English Dictionary at one point, and so he actually wrote a lot of the definitions that we still use for words beginning with W. So walrus is an example. The definition of the word walrus was written by the same person who wrote The Lord of the Rings. Isn't that mental? I tell everyone that fact because I think it's so fascinating. And so after reading this book, I am going to be insufferable. I'm going to have so many facts about the OED, which I will just be telling everyone. So that is the dictionary people. Okay, I have three books left to show you. This one I've actually already finished. This was my first read of the year. This is A Shining by John Foss. It's translated by Damien Siles. This is like a 80 page kind of short story slash novella written by John Foss, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature last year. Now he's a Norwegian writer and I hadn't read any of his work when he won the prize. So I was desperate to do so and fix that immediately. So I did first thing this year. And I have to say when I first started reading this book, I thought it was so, monosyllabic, the sentences are really punchy and short, and I was so bored. Honestly, I was like, I'm, I almost DNF this book. And then it all made sense. In the second half, oh, it pulled me back. And it becomes this really haunting novel about loneliness and aloneness. And it's this guy, he's in the woods on his own. It's dark, it's cold, and he encounters this shining figure in the woods. And I won't tell you who it turns out to be, but it was spellbinding and captivating. It had me in the palm of its hand. And I found the second half incredibly intense. And actually the writing style lends itself very, very well to the second half of the book. And the first half is just basically building up to that moment. So it's one of those books you just have to stick with. And I'm so glad that I did. So that is A Shining by John Foss. This one is called Boys Alive. It's by Pier Paolo Pasolini and translated from the Italian by Tim Parks. It was originally published in 1955 and it's been republished and repackaged in this edition. And it's described as a novel which kind of splinters off and branches out in all different directions. So there's not one kind of clear cohesive plot. It all kind of 
take you on these different routes, down all these different paths, more meander through the novel, and as we interact with each of these different characters. And I thought that was a really fascinating approach to storytelling, and one that I found very appealing. So I'm always trying to challenge myself with different ways that you can tell stories, and I don't know if I've ever read anything like this that's structured and formatted in this way, and so that was why I picked this up. Written in the aftermath of Pasolini's move from the provinces to Rome, the novel captures the hunger and anger, waywardness and squalor of the big city. The life of the novel is the life of the city streets. From the streets too comes its raw, mongrel, assaultive language. And as a city boy, I love being in the city, I love reading about the city. This really appeals to me, so. Okay, last book. The final book that I picked up in this particular haul. The book buying ban officially starts right now. No more, I have to get through these books first, but this is The Librarianist. And as someone who spent last year building my home library, something about this was just calling out to me. This is by Patrick Dewitt, who also wrote a book called French Exit. From the best-selling and award-winning author comes the story of Bob Comet, a man who has lived his life. From the best-selling and award-winning author comes the story of Bob Comet, a man who has lived his life through his love for literature, unaware his own experience as a poignant and affecting narrative in itself. As I've said a million times, I really am always drawn to microscopic character studies where we look at their lives on a granular level, and I think that's what this book is going to be. So that is The Librarianist. It's me. And that brings this book haul to a close. Thank you so much for being here. If you stuck around for the entire thing, thank you. I hope that you found a book that appeals to you and that you want to pick up and read in 2024. Let me know for when my book buying ban inevitably ends in like three days time. What other books I should read in 2024? What was your favorite book that you read last year? Let me know because I would love to read them. I think it's gonna be a really great year. I am feeling re-energized by this kind of fresh start. Cool things are gonna happen in 2024 for this community and for all of us, so I am pumped. So thanks so much for watching this video. All the best, stay in touch, have a wonderful day. You can subscribe for more from me. You can follow me on Instagram, on TikTok, on Goodreads and the Storygraph for daily updates on what I'm reading. I did stop kind of reviewing things on Goodreads, but I'm kind of back to writing reviews. I'm also sharing all of my book reviews on threads as well, as well as the usual places. So yeah, I'm gonna be reviewing books anywhere you use the internet, pretty much. <laughs> I will be there with book reviews. All the best, stay in touch, have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.